Welcome. Um, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about pneumocystis, which is an organism that causes infections in mammals throughout the world and also is an important pathogen in usually immunocompromised patients. And I'm going to summarize what we know about the organism and its biology and something about its transmission uh, as a prelude to learning more about the disease that it causes with other slide sets. Um, <clears throat> there are many, many different animals that have have pneumocystis in their lungs and each species of uh, mammal or a rabbit or whatever has a different species in its lungs and you can see here examples with a specific species in rodents, bats, uh, insectivores, marsupials, uh, ungulates, mammals and dolphins, primates, various carnivores and also rabbits, lagomorphs. So the, each different species is co-evolved with the different uh, species of mammal or um, vertebrate that it's within. And what's happened is that they've named them separately for each different species. So in humans, um, we have Pneumocystis gyrovecii, which was actually first described uh, over 100 years ago, but was renamed when they realized that it was its own separate fungus. And um, in rats, you have Pneumocystis carinii, and a lot of the early literature about pneumocystis infections was based on Pneumocystis carinii because they thought it was the same species. Um, Pneumocystis marina, uh, Pneumocystis orchidolagi, and numerous other species here. So because the name changed, we originally had it as Pneumocystis carinii, and then it would cause pneumonia. It was named as an organism causing Pneumocystis pneumonia PCP. But some people prefer to call it PJP, but I prefer to call it PCP because that takes you back through all of the literature over time. Now, if you look at the co-evolution of this organism, it's, it's a co-speciation over many, many millions of years. So as different mammals diverged, uh, so the pneumocystis also diverged. So, for example, our pneumocystis is most closely related to the chimpanzee, as you'd expect. And you've got various different monkeys here, and these species are also relatively closely related. And here you have different sorts of monkeys, marmosets, tamarins, down here, and then you've got lemurs, and then they're quite separate from mice and rats. So these species have evolved over many, many millions of years, and so has the pneumocystis, and they've diverged to form different species. And a different species, of course, means that the fungus can't mate with another one that is of a different species. So they are discrete within their own um, uh, species group. These are the old world primates. These are the new world primates, lemurs and rodents, and that's what you see there. There are some of these infections caused in disease in animals. So young rabbits get pneumocystis pneumonia. Um, young horses get a pneumocystis pneumonia. A specific dog breeds, but not all dog breeds, also get pneumocystis pneumonia. Now, they don't have AIDS because most of the infections in humans are AIDS patients. Um, not all, but most of them. These are just uh, young and immature immune systems that get infection. Now, it used to be thought of as a parasite and some of the words, or a protozoan, um, but in about 1989, they, some work done with molecular biology to look at the different genetics, worked out that it was more closely linked to a fungus than to a protozoan. And shortly after that, it was renamed Pneumocystis gyrovecii after Otto Gyrovech, who was a Czech um, scientist. And it belongs to this Tafrinomycotina branch of the a fungal kingdom, which is not too far removed from a fungus, a yeast fungus called Saccharomyces pombi. And Saccharomyces pombi has been used a lot in the experiments. It, it, one of the key um, fungus fungi for working on the cell cycle. And some one of our um, British scientists won the Nobel Prize for working on this and looking at the cycle of growth within a normal a cell. Pneumocystis cannot be routinely grown outside the human lungs. It doesn't grow. So if you have it in the lungs, it dies as soon as it comes out of the lungs. You can only grow it in human lungs, from person to person. 
And that means it's pretty tricky to study because most things you can see and you can grow and you can play with, but that's not the case with this. So the transmission life cycle and even just what it looks like has been difficult to work out specifically. So there are two broad morphological forms of pneumocystis. There's something called a trophozoite and something called a cyst. And those two words are typical words for protozoal infections, but they're used for pneumocystis because they go back in history for, many, for a very long time. And most of the infections in lungs, are 90 to 95%, are trophozoites. And then cysts are a small um, a form that's more resistant to um, um, destruction. Trophozoites are vegetative, they're amoeboid in shape, they appear mononuclear, okay, because they're relatively small, but not very small. They're mostly haploid, which means they have one genome, not two, whereas we have two genomes, and they have a thin cell wall, so they don't, the cell wall doesn't stain very well. And when you do microscopy, you can miss the trophozoites because they have a thin cell wall. Cytoplasmic projections help them attach to type 1 pneumocytes, and that's how they stick inside the lungs. Now, the mature cysts have eight individual spores within them, and these are spherical, irregular or banana-shaped and consist of a single nucleus, dense cytoplasm and a cell wall. So they're quite different in these two forms of disease. So the life cycle um, starts within the human here with an asexual life cycle with a nucleus, the mitochondrion, and then it grows and it, it, it goes, if you like, round this circle here. And then you have a sexual life cycle, because all fungi also have a sexual life cycle as well as an asexual life cycle. And you start with the cyst, which is haploid, uh, and then you form in this pre-cyst, it matures around, and you get with a sporozoite, and you get more cysts formed like this. So it goes round and round in this normal cycle. And that happens inside normal human lungs. So what that also means is that the place that you catch pneumocystis is from another human being. Okay, and they have done experiments with molecular techniques where they've taken a patient with pneumocystis and they have looked at how many spores are in the air or how many uh, genomes are in the air and at about a metre away from a person there's 10 to the 4, so there's 10,000 per metre squared of air. Okay, if you move 3 metres away from a person that drops down to 10 to the 3, 10 to the 5, it's still quite a lot and then five metres away, it's about 100, and eight metres away, you can still detect it. So if you imagine in a hospital ward that you've got a patient with pneumocystis pneumonia and somebody else next door who's got AIDS but not got pneumocystis pneumonia, you can get transmission from one person to the other. And there are outbreaks described all over the world in transplant patients, kidney transplant patients particularly, where people have come to the outpatients for their monitoring and they've caught this infection. And that's a problem. So the people who are major transmitters of this infection include those with COPD, which is a, a chronic respiratory infection, usually in older people with related to smoking, and those with other chronic respiratory diseases. HIV patients with low CD4 cell counts, so poor immune status, and particularly those who actively have pneumocystis. So those who haven't got a cough and are perfectly well are, are less likely to transmit it, although they have higher rates, but those with pneumocystis definitely do. Other immunocompromised patients, so patients with leukemia, patients with kidney transplant, heart transplant, um, and including some patients with cancer as well. Pregnancy reduces your immune system a little so that you don't reject the baby, and that allows you to have more pneumocystis in the lungs. Very young children, particularly those with a viral infection, they have more pneumocystis in the lungs. And then other groups of patients whose immune systems are damaged. So the risk factors for colonization include um, a low CD4 cell count, smoking, your geographic location for reasons we don't understand. There seems to be more pneumocystis in some areas than others a recent exposure to pneumocystis pneumonia, somebody with pneumocystis pneumonia, and a lack of taking preventative treatment or prophylaxis with pneumocystis pneumonia. So what happens? You actually get increased mucus production when this fungus gets in. 
and that's particularly a problem in young babies. And actually there was a recent description of some uh, sudden infant death syndrome related to pneumocystis. You upregulate the immune response with alveolar macrophages, CD8 and CD4 cells. You get damaged and the alveolar cells die in the, in the deep part of the lung. You get increased capillary leakiness and you get more fluid in the lungs. And that leads to pulmonary edema, which is, which is one of the reasons you get very breathless. And sometimes you get actual lung destruction with these pneumatoceles, which are like cysts in the lungs. Um, and that's particularly true in HIV patients, and it, it, particularly if it's a slowly progressive infection. Um, but usually you can't breathe because of this increased capillary, uh, per, capillary permeability and, if you like, um, swelling of the lungs or, or, or in the lungs. And most infection occurs early in life, and it's the most prevalent organism that you find in infants. So if you look at a baby's lungs, this is the organism that you find. Okay? And almost everybody has got it exposure by two years of age. So you've all got it. And if you have a bad upper respiratory tract infection, you might pass it to somebody else. And if you get cancer or you have HIV infection, you're quite likely to pass it to somebody else. So that's the way it works. That's the way it transmits. So because there are, each species is host-specific, there's no animal reservoir, there's no environmental reservoir. It requires somebody else to give it to you, okay? And it's from an exogenous source from another person. And so what you get is patients who live together or uh, spend time in the ward together or are in outpatients together often have similar strains. And we can actually look at the strains, work out which strain is which, okay? And there are many reports of outbreaks, particularly, as I say, in kidney transplant patients. So you get infection as a baby and it's then asymptomatic, or you might just have a mild cold-like symptoms, and then you clear the infection, or nearly clear the infection. And, or you get colonization, and you have a low level infection over a long period of time, and you have a low number of bugs there, and then when that organism, when you, um, you get another infection, particularly another virus infection, or you get immunocompromised, then that amount of fungus rises and there's more colonization present. So in summary, uh, pneumocystis durovecii exposure is universal in humans. It's acquired early in life. Each pneumocystis species is specific to the mammal or vertebrate that is there. And all the transmission is airborne. Thank you very much for your attention.